Michael Weber, Artistic Director of Chicago's Porchlight Music Theater. Opening on Broadway at the Imperial Theater, May 16th, 1946, Annie Get Your Gun, with music and lyrics by Irving Berlin, and a book by brother and sister team Dorothy and Herbert Fields, was a colossal hit and became one of the longest-running musicals of the decade. Dorothy Fields, who had most recently written the books for the Broadway musicals Let's Face It, Something for the Boys, Mexican Hayride, and Up in Central Park, for which she also wrote the lyrics, had the idea for a musical about Annie Oakley to star her friend Ethel Merman. After producer Mike Todd turned the project down, Fields approached a new production team, Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein II. After the success of their first musical collaboration, Oklahoma, Rogers and Hammerstein had decided to become producers of both their own theatrical ventures and those by other authors. They agreed to produce the musical and asked Jerome Kern to compose the music. Fields would write the lyrics, and she and her brother Herbert would write the book. Kern, who had been composing for movie musicals in Hollywood, returned to New York on November 2nd, 1945, to begin work on the score to Annie Get Your Gun. But three days later, he collapsed on the street due to a cerebral hemorrhage. Kern was hospitalized, and sadly, he died on November 11th, 1945. The producers and Fields then asked Irving Berlin to write the musical's score. Fields agreed to step down as lyricist, knowing that Berlin preferred to write both music and lyrics to his songs. Berlin initially declined to write the score, worrying that he would be unable to write songs to fit specific scenes in what he called, quote, a situation show, unquote, having up until that time been most comfortable writing musical reviews, even after trying his hand at musical comedies like Louisiana Purchase with William Gaxton and Victor Moore and The Coconuts for the Marx Brothers. Oscar Hammerstein persuaded him to study the script and try writing some songs based on it, and within days, Berlin returned with the songs Doing What Comes Naturally, You Can't Get a Man with a Gun, and There's No Business Like Show Business. Berlin's songs suited the story and Ethel Merman's abilities, and with enthusiasm from all concerned, he agreed to undertake the production. According to some sources, the role of Annie was originally offered to Mary Martin, who turned it down. On opening night, her husband, Richard Halliday, saw the show. Upon his return home following the premiere, he informed her, quote, You're going to kill yourself, unquote. When time came to send out the post-Broadway national tour, and Merman was unwilling to do it, Martin jumped at the chance, going on the road for approximately two years. Dolores Gray would star in the London premiere, and Judy Garland was slated to undertake the film adaptation. Her inability to complete the production got her replaced, and that is the cast we have for you in this radio preview production of the film as part of National Music Week. Set in the Old West, Annie Get Your Gun is an entertainment representative of its era that employed unacceptably stereotypical and racist depictions of Native Americans as part of the production. Fortunately, neither those characterizations nor songs, like I'm an Indian Too, appear in this radio presentation. Immediately following this broadcast, we'll be having a discussion with Indigenous theater and film artist Frankie Peterson about this and other issues related to depictions of Native Americans and Indigenous peoples in the performing arts. Here are the stars Betty Hutton, Louis Calhern, and Keenan Wynn, with producer Arthur Freed, director George Sidney, and composer Irving Berlin in this May 1st, 1950 radio broadcast of... Annie, get your gun. This is National Music Week. In this special nationwide broadcast, NBC salutes the great contribution made to American music by show business from Broadway to Hollywood. <laughs> Business like show, business like no business I know. Everything about it is a feeling. Everything the traffic will allow. So where could you get that happy feeling when you are feeling that extra power? 
In conjunction with National Music Week, with portions transcribed, NBC is proud to bring you the stars of the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Technicolor musical, Annie Get Your Gun, with Betty Hutton, Howard Keel, Louis Calhern, Keenan Wynn, producer Arthur Freed, director George Sidney, Irving Berlin, and Robert Armbruster, the NBC orchestra and chorus. <laughs> The music of America stems from many sources, and none has contributed more to the vast storehouse of melody that America sings than musical comedy. For today, the Broadway show is no longer confined to Times Square. Through the magic of motion pictures, all the color and excitement of New York's greatest stage successes can be seen in every corner of our land. Currently, it's Annie Get Your Gun. And here is the distinguished actor who plays the role of Buffalo Bill in the musical film, your host, Louis Calhoun. Thank you. Annie Get Your Gun, like so many other wonderful Broadway musicals, brings to life a colorful period in America's past. An era when Buffalo Bill's Wild West show toured the nation at the turn of the century. The star of the show was a girl who uh, offered, right before your very eyes, the most thrilling, stupendous, unbelievable exhibition of marksmanship the universe has ever seen. The world's greatest shot, Miss Annie Oakley! Since Vaughn Monroe. Well, Betty, Betty, this is quite a surprise. You were expecting maybe Hopalong Cassidy? <laughs> oh, no. I just wasn't expecting you to bring your guns with you tonight. Oh, of course I have it, Louie. You know, after all, I've been playing the original pistol pack, and Mom and I certainly carried the pistols. Well, Betty, there's nothing the matter with your packing either. But, uh, uh, Betty, <laughs> this being National Music Week, I can't think of anybody more qualified than you to sing some of the songs Broadway and Hollywood have made famous. Are you, uh, in voice? Oh, sure. I've been singing around the house all day. Ah, you love music that much. Oh, no. It's just that there's a vacant lot next door, and I don't want anybody to build on it. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're ready, Mr. Armbruster, me, 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 I'm warming up. Well, if you ask me, she's already at the boiling point. <laughs> Taking stock of what I have and what I haven't, what do I find? The things I've got will keep me satisfied. Check it up on what I have, and what I haven't, what I find. A healthy balance on the credit side. Got no diamond, got no pearl Still I think I'm a lucky girl I got the sun in the morning and the moon at night Got no mansion, got no yacht Still I'm happy with what I've got I got the sun in the morning and the moon at night The sunshine gives me a lucky day Moonshine Gives me the Milky Way Got no checkbooks, got no banks Still I'd like to express my thanks I got the sun in the morning and the moon at night And with the sun in the morning and the moon in the evening I'm alright Got no butler, got no maid Still I think I've been overpaid I got the sun in the morning and the moon at night You got the sun in the morning and the moon at night Got no silver, got no gold What you got can't be bought or sold I got the sun in the morning and the moon at night You got the sun in the morning and the moon at night oh, sunshine gives me a lucky day Moonshine gives me the Milky Way Got no diamond, got no pearl Still Miss Annie the lucky girl I got the sun in the morning Sun in the morning moon Wonderful 
wonderful, Betty. Even as Annie gets your gun as full of great songs as had a great cast. Betty Hutton, Howard Keel. Louis Calhern. Edward Arnold, J. Carol Nash, Thousands of Horses, Keenan Wynn. I, uh... <laughs> I, uh... Thank you, fan. I, uh... <laughs> I beg your pardon, old man. Would you mind giving me priority over the horses? <laughs> Keenan Wynn. Forgive me, Keenan. After working with those horses for nearly a year, it's a wonder I don't dream about them. Well, I do dream about them. Every morning I wake up with a bow-legged crease in the side of my pajama pants. Well, why a crease in only one side? I ride side saddle. <laughs> well, I venture to say Howard Keel's probably been dreaming about Annie Get Your Gun, too. Not often a young American singer is elevated to stardom in his first picture. If it's possible to elevate a fellow who's six feet four. Oh, gosh. You know, every time I think of Howard, my heart pounds, my spine tingles, the pulse quivers, I break into a fever and... Hey, get me a doctor, I'm a sick woman! <laughs> Betty, I take it you were impressed by Howard. You know, I'm six foot four, too. Oh, yeah, and I want you to know how wonderful it was working with two great, big, handsome, intelligent fellows. Aren't you forgetting a third? Oh, oh, of course, two and a third great, big, handsome, intelligent fellows. <laughs> Of course, she's, uh, she's just joshing. You know, Betty, there aren't enough words for me to praise the wonderful job you did playing Annie Oakley, the world's greatest gal with a gun. Now, tell me seriously, uh, what did you think of me in the picture? Well, I think you're the cleverest, handsomest, most intelligent, well-built, personable, and likable man I've ever worked with. Really? Yes. Now, give me back my gun. <laughs> The girl that I marry will have to be as pink and as soft as a nursery. You know, somehow I just can't picture comparing Betty Hutton to a nursery. Oh, I don't know. You just never have heard the noise that can come out of a nursery. Oh. Besides, <laughs> I think songwriters are entitled to a little poetic life. Arthur Freed, the producer of Annie Get Your Gun, as well as many musical hits, including On the Town and Easter Parade, will vouch for that. Won't you, Arthur? I'll be glad to. Ladies and gentlemen, Arthur Freed. Of course, I don't know if I'm exactly what you'd call an authority, Louis. Well, I don't know what you're worried about, Arthur. As one of the nation's outstanding writers of songs, you've accounted for Wedding of the Painted Doll, You Were Meant for Me, I Cried for You, Singing in the Rain. Singing in the Rain? Well, I was singing that just the other day in the shower. I hope it wasn't the first time. Oh, no, no, I've been taking showers for years. <laughs> what about Pagan Love Song? You wrote that back in the 20s, didn't you, Arthur? Yes, I was writing with Herb Brown then. Those were the days when to write a song, the songwriter would take his inspiration from some romantic, faraway place. Now they just walk into a kitchen and come up with a rag mop. <laughs> oh, well, you see, you songwriters have kitchens now. Uh, I can remember when people used to think in order to write a song, why... You had to live in a garret and starve to death. Yeah, I tried that once. I went up in the attic and went hungry for two days to write a love song. How'd it turn out? Hungriest love song you ever heard. <laughs> well, don't give up so easy, Betty. Try again. There's always room for one more good love song. Yes, and if it's half as good as Irving Berlin's, they say it's wonderful, they'll make room for it. Well, I'll push the furniture back for that one right now if you'll do the honors, Miss Hutton. You don't have to coax me, Mr. Wynn. That falling in love is wonderful. It's wonderful. So they say. Known as romance is one. 
Light fans. This is Carmen Gonzalez, Development Director. Thank you for listening to WPMT. If you value programming like this, please consider making a donation today at porchlightmusictheater.org. We appreciate your consideration and hope you enjoy the show. I think it's really amazing when you stop to think of it. A little girl from the backwoods who could neither read nor write became the toast of two continents. And all because she could handle a squirrel gun. Oh, yes. Annie could hit a bullseye riding a motorcycle or bouncing on top of a stagecoach. She could even shoot an apple off a man's head. How did she do it? Well, I'll be glad to show you how she did it if you'll put an apple on top of your head. I'll shoot it off and you'll never know it. <laughs> now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What if you miss? You'll never know that either. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. I'll, I'll take your word for it. But if you really want to demonstrate something, uh, I understand Annie was quite a gal with a kiss, too. <laughs> Thanks. I'll take your word for that. <laughs> <laughs> Annie's right. Every man who ever saw Annie fell in love with her. Even though in those days, girls were brought up to believe that if you wanted to win a man, you had to be gentle, ladylike, and never be a roughneck. Yep. It took Annie to prove if you're rough, they'll neck. <laughs> If music is the universal language of mankind, George Sidney is certainly a man who speaks everybody's language. Director, not only of Annie Get Your Gun, but also such big musical successes as The Harvey Girls and Anchors Away, this salute to National Week would not be complete without him. George Sidney. George with all those hits to your credit, I'd say you've had quite a hand in the contribution of show business to American music. Louis, as George M. Cohan once said, give me the making of the songs of the nation, and I care not who makes its laws. <laughs> oh, that's very good. <laughs> that's very clever. I didn't know it was that amusing, Duddy. Oh, well, well, maybe it isn't, but you being the director of the picture, <laughs> I thought I'd play it safe. <laughs> <laughs> You know, after all, you might want to use her for a sequel. <laughs> I don't want to, del to delude anyone, buddy. The director isn't the only one responsible for a motion picture. I know when I was directing Annie, every day my head was in Mr. Mayer's office. Dory Sherry would have one arm. Arthur Freed would have the other arm. Dorothy Fields, who collaborated on the book, would have my ear. Gosh, with your head, your arms, and an ear gone, that didn't leave you much to work with. <laughs> but you came through anyway. Gad, George, I'm proud of you. <laughs> you know, George, it's always amazed me how you can go from directing one big action scene in a picture like Annie to a romantic scene. Louis, when you're directing Betty Hutton, it's, it's practically the same thing. <laughs> Betty, you know your romantic scenes have an exciting, well, a breathless quality. Oh, I've always been that way. Yeah, I remember the very first time I kissed a boy. Even then, I was breathless. You were? Well, Natch, I had to chase him eight blocks. <laughs> the 
That's a very interesting approach. <laughs> How do you explain it? <laughs> well, as Irving Berlin put it, it's just a matter of a doing what comes naturally. <laughs> Folks are dumb where I come from. They ain't had any learning. Still, they're happy as can be at the wind. What comes naturally? Naturally. Folks like us could never fuss with schools and books and learning. Still, we've gone from A to Z at the wind. What comes naturally? What comes naturally? You don't have to know how to read or write when you're out with the feller in the pale moonlight. You don't have to look in a book to find what he thinks of the moon and what is on his mind. That comes naturally! That comes naturally! My uncle out of Texas, can't even write his name. He signs checks with X's, but they cash him just the same. Uncle Ben got angry when they caught him stealing chicken. I'm within my right that he a doing what to come naturally. What to come naturally. Uncle Jed has never read an almanac on drinking. Still, he's always on a spree. And what comes naturally? And what comes naturally? Sister Sal, whose muse a cow has never had a lesson. Still, she's learned to sing off key. And what comes naturally? And what comes naturally? You don't have to go to a private school not to pick up a penny near a stubborn mule. You don't have to have a professor's dome not to go for the honey when the bee's at home. That comes naturally! That comes naturally! My uncle don't pay taxes, his address never gives. They can't collect his taxes, for they don't know where he lives. Now, Dick was always sick, but never saw a doctor. He just died at 93, doing what to come naturally. Doing what to come naturally. Doing what comes Wonderful, Betty. You know, on Broadway, when a show has almost come to its final curtain, it's customary for the star to step up to the footlights and reprise the hit tunes while everybody else cries, author, author. I think we've just about reached that point tonight. Yes, but what about this author, author? Well, Betty, we're on a two-way hookup with New York, and I know Irving Berlin is on the other end, so why don't you suggest something? Oh, all right. Irving, have you 10 or 20,000 words ready on Annie Get Your Gun? Well, Betty, as you know... Annie Get Your Gun is very close to me. I had a wonderful time writing the score for the show. The stage production has been a tremendous success. As a matter of fact, two companies played in America, three in England, one in Australia, several companies are playing in Scandinavia, and just recently, a French Annie opened in Paris and is a terrific success. Naturally, I was concerned about the picture version. Well, I'm just thrilled with it. I think it is the best job of transferring a Broadway musical to the screen that has ever been done. And there have been values added in the picture version that we couldn't get on the stage. It's difficult to enumerate the many people who made the stage version of Annie Get Your Gun possible and the great many who worked on the picture version. So congratulations to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berlin. And now the final curtain on the magnificent score that marks Broadway and Hollywood's current contribution to American music, the music from Annie Get Your Gun, brought so thrillingly to life on the screen by Betty Hutton and Howard Keel. They say that falling in love is wonderful. It's wonderful. So they say
the call who said it I know I never read it I only know they tell me that love is grand and the thing that's known as romance is wonderful a special NBC salute to show business and its contribution to American music from Broadway to Hollywood. Portions were transcribed. Presented in conjunction with National Music Week, the program starred Betty Hutton, Howard Keel, Louis Calhern, Keenan Wynn, Arthur Free, George Sidney, and Irving Berlin. It was produced by Warren Lewis, directed by Robert Packham, coordinated by Les Peterson, and written by Ed Helwig. Music was under the direction of Robert Armbruster. Betty Hutton appeared by arrangement with Paramount Pictures and can soon be seen co-starring with Fred Astaire in the Paramount production, Let's Stand. Your announcer has been Frank Barton. This is America's number one advertising medium, NBC. That was the May 1st, 1950 radio preview of the soon-to-open motion picture version of the Broadway musical Annie Get Your Gun. It's well worth knowing that with its comical depiction of the real-life character of Sitting Bull, as well as songs like I'm an Indian Too, Annie Get Your Gun is part of a long line of vintage entertainments like Peter Pan and the Lone Ranger that regrettably portrayed Native Americans and indigenous peoples in a limited and racist fashion. With us now is Frankie Peterson, indigenous theater and film artist, to talk about this with us. Thank you for joining me, Frankie. I'm so glad you're here. Of course, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let me start out just from the personal point of view. How do you personally respond when you are exposed to these kinds of racist or insensitive depictions of Native Americans and indigenous people in, in these vintage and old plays and films and TV shows? What is your sort of gut response? I think like after we get over the like somewhat traumatizing aspect of it, I think there's just such a deep sense of like hurt and heartbreak. Mm -hmm. you no, know? like because I can't help me. You know, I work a lot with youth and I can't help but think about how young people are affected by seeing this, you know. Um you know, we, we see all these stereotypes, even like, say, like with the modern conversation that's really uh popular right now about mascots, you know, there are so many statistics that like 
um, these young kids, like seeing these stereotypes and seeing these, you know, caricatures negatively affect native youth's uh, mental health. Another aspect of this too is that, you know, there is already so little representation for us. So not only is you know, majority of representation like bad, there's very few things depicting us in a truthful or good light, you know? Mm -hmm. And also I can't help but think about how like this has affected my family, like personally, you know? Um, My mom was adopted out to a white family when she was a baby. And my grandfather, her adoptive father, growing up loved to watch like Westerns. Mm -hmm. Um, Seeing how that still affects her to this day, Um, and how she didn't have a connection to her native side of her family for a really long time, and how a lot of the representation that she was exposed to was in old Westerns, which didn't didn't have great representation. Um, Seeing how even like later in life has like still affected her really hurts. And I just can't help but think about like her as a kid, all the other like youth of like today watching this. So yeah, I think there's like obviously some trauma, but also like a lot of, lot of heartbreak for the young people. Right. It's amazing when you see, and again, we're talking about vintage material created in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, when there was no thought whatsoever that advertising, you know, cowboy and Indian game sets for kids and the costumes and uh, that they would literally market this to kids in the same fashion that now we look at the way they marketed cigarettes or things like that, that nobody was asking the questions. Nobody for one minute didn't think that this was just fine. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing when you begin to 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 recognize it. Now, a musical like Annie Get Your Gun portrays real life people as characters within the story. In this particular story with Annie Get Your Gun, Annie Oakley, Buffalo Bill Cody, you know, who are show people. But then um, Sitting Bull, obviously, who was a real life person, is in the show as well. Moving forward as as a writer and a director yourself, what would be the kind of things that you would insist upon that you would say, this is how we're going to have to treat this material? I think the most important thing is is hiring Native people to be a part of this process, you know? Uh, I think it goes without saying to have, you know, obviously Native performers in these roles, but to have Native people in the process, like from the beginning, you know, I think there is some issues I feel like where people want to bring on a consultant when you're already so much farther into the project that it's like, you know, there's only so much you can do at that point. You know, the script is written and there's not a lot you can change. So I think having a consultant or even having like, you know, Native writers or directors or anything there at the beginning of this process is really important. I think there's plenty of TV shows and movies and other things where they already have it written and figured out and then they bring on a consultant at the end and then they're like, oh, well, we did our part, you know, and I think feel like the consultant There's obviously like deadlines you need to meet. And then there are like not a lot of changes you can make that far in the process. I think it's also really important to also have, uh, say, if we had like Sitting Bull um, or any kind of specific real life person to also have someone, if you can, like from that specific tribe have input on that as well. Um, I think it's also important, say, if we were to like you know, look at a piece like this, or we would be writing a story about these real life people to just ask yourself, why this play? Why now? You know, um, I read an interview recently that talked about, you know, if you can't think of like 15 answers to why this play, why now, then maybe, maybe we just shouldn't do it. Um, so I think those are, uh, all things to really consider, um, when wanting to create these stories and wanting to look and highlight these old pieces, asking yourself those questions is important. Right. That's such a great point in terms of more than just to say that we just want to do it because everybody likes it as opposed to why are we doing it? But you bring up a really good point, which is that there's a certainly from the vantage point where we are now in terms of creating new material, we can make sure that we've got our ducks in a row before we begin to approach certain subject matter. But what do you think about material that is already written that might have problematic components within it 
Do you think that it is valuable to do that material and and approach it and expose it for what it is? Or should, do you think it should be just simply avoided entirely? Um, I think there's a lot of pros and cons for each of them. You know, I feel that there can be like an educational component to it. But I also have to think it's like, does that overweigh the like re-traumatizing of like, you know, plenty of BIPOC, you know. Uh, so that's something that I constantly think about. Um, I think if it were a space um, where, you know, you don't uh, have like BIPOC being traumatized and or they could step out of the room for that, um, then, you know, okay. But for the most part, I feel like with a lot of these pieces, um, I, I think a lot of them should be like avoided. And I, I think we're seeing, you know, I think what you talked about earlier with like Peter Pan, like you're seeing um, like Disney plus that you can stream it on, um, pull it from like certain parts of their channel, you know? I th so I think the, the kids channel, uh, Peter Pan has been pulled from that. I think I read an article like early, like earlier this week um, about how, uh, I forgot what streaming service it's on, but it, like there are two or three SpongeBob episodes that were kind of problematic. It was like one that like dealt with the pandemic. So they were like, no. And there was one that, that they thought was like inappropriate for children at the time. Uh, so they decided to pull it as well. So I think it's like a very fine line between using this kind of representation and these subject matters as like educational, um, but like does that really outweigh like the re-traumatizing of, of these Native people of like BIPOC? But yeah, I think there's a fine line of like educational, but also definitely like a negative effect of this. Right. Yeah, it's interesting with Disney Plus, or I certainly uh, noticed uh, with... Uh, places like Turner Classic Movies, because their whole platform is dealing with vintage works of art, it, films that are from an era where very frequently you're going to be encountering all kinds of problematic material. And they've, you know, developed these, these talking sessions or conversations before films like Breakfast at Tiffany's or Gone with the Wind, things like that. Um, and it is an interesting moment that we're in, in terms of how do we deal with a work of art? as well as larger conversations that are happening about composers or painters, and they've left their works of art, but when we find out who they were personally, how do we wrestle with, with access to their art, whether we want to observe? It's hard to separate art from the artist sometimes. Right. Where do you think that we could learn more that the general public, where, where is a good place for someone who is not a member of, the, of, of your community to be able to learn more if they, re, if they wanted to dive in and go, how do I begin to expand my exposure? I think something that the Indian Center kind of prides itself in is that like, yeah, we are a center here to support the Native like community here in Chicago, um, but I think we're also a point for education, you know. I feel like the trendy thing to do right now is uh, land acknowledgements. That's really big. You know, people ask us, oh, sh should I do this land acknowledgement? And like, in reality is like, well, a land acknowledgement is a commitment to uplift and like build relationships with the indigenous people of this land, right? And if you were not uplifting and supporting these communities, then like this land acknowledgement doesn't mean anything, you know? I feel like the best way to do that is to like build relationships with these communities. AIC is lucky enough where we also consider ourselves a point of education, you know? Um, We've had plenty of like school groups come in and just wanting to talk, which I think is really great. I tell people all the time uh, if they want to like just learn more about Native people, there's no need to like be weird about it. Uh, I say like go to a powwow. Like I feel like that open to the public. Anyone can go. And I feel like, you know, to see Native people um how we really are in like <laughs> this real modern contemporary way instead of the way that you see us shown in like history books, uh, I think is really important. So I think uplifting and building these relationships and just uh, like, don't be worried about it. Just like, I don't know, go to a powwow and just, like, you know, hang out. Like it's, it's not that, it's not that, you know, weird. <laughs> right. Right. Well, I, I'm so appreciative of your time to, to come and talk with us uh, about this on this program. It, it is so important and uh, and it is so exciting to be able to learn more and know that there are places 
like the Indian, Indian Center here in Chicago that we can go to. So thank you so much, Frankie Peterson, for being with me today. I really appreciate your time. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Theaters across the country need your support now more than ever. We hope you'll consider a donation to Porchlight Music Theater today. Just go to porchlightmusictheater.org. Until next time on Classic Musicals from the Golden Age of Radio, I'm Michael Barrett.